For years, Kyle Myers, in character as Dimitri, mesmerized his audience of the widely popular FPS Russia channel as he showcased a wide variety of extravagant weaponry. With an audience in the millions, this channel was a go-to for gun enthusiasts all over the world, all enhanced by Kyle's funny and charismatic persona. However, unbeknownst to many, behind the entertainment lurked a dark story involving crimes, conspiracy, jail time, and even murder. It's no secret that, time after time, we come to find that a lot of happy-go-lucky entertainers out there have a darker story going on behind the scenes that none of us would expect. That's exactly what we get with today's story, the story of FPS Russia. Today's story is about a man named Kyle Lamar Myers, better known to most people out there as FPS Russia and FPS Kyle to a lesser extent. The man is nothing short of a YouTube legend, having one of the biggest and most well-known channels of all time. It's doubtful that any guy who was a teenager or young adult in the prime Call of Duty days hasn't heard of him. What most people don't know is why he stopped uploading videos or about all of the conspiracies, criminal charges, and even murder cases associated with him. So as usual, let's start back at the beginning. Kyle was born in 1986, being about 21 when Call of Duty 4 came out. The game was a huge hit and virtually every young man in the US was playing it. YouTube was just becoming a big thing at the time as well. With people wanting to learn more about the game, get some tips, and watch some clips, they turned to none other than YouTube, and that's where Kyle came in. Kyle started off by making a YouTube channel called KLM5986, which mainly consisted of Call of Duty gameplay footage with his commentary. Gaining in popularity, he began to collab with other creators in the same sphere and grew even more. Eventually, he ended up creating the FPS Russia channel that most people know. This is where he began to act in character, playing the fictional Dmitry Potapov, a quote, professional Russian from Moscow. At the time, Kyle was working at a car dealership. One of his co-workers was Russian, and he would often try to emulate his accent. Using this, he created the character of Dmitry, and people really seemed to love the bit. The channel continued to grow more and more, bit by bit over time, but the biggest growth spurt would come when a certain idea came to him. Kyle was big into guns, owning 40 of them himself and often firing them on his dad's expansive farm out in Georgia. While he liked video games, he was often disappointed in how inaccurate the portrayal of the guns and explosives in the games were. As Call of Duty grew in popularity, so did people's interest in firearms. Kyle thought that he might as well show off how these guns actually work in real life for anyone who might be interested. As it turns out, a lot of people were interested. He uploaded these gun demonstration videos alongside his regular Call of Duty commentary videos, but the real videos quickly eclipsed the view count of the commentary videos by a massive margin. So Kyle began to focus entirely on that content instead. Given that acquiring these guns would require a special license and a good chunk of cash, most people didn't have access to them. Luckily, Kyle did. As Dimitri, he would explain the guns he would use within the video, sometimes going into a little bit of a history lesson as well, before ultimately blowing apart some bottles, mannequins, or even photos of Justin Bieber. Over time, Kyle's videos got a little bit more insane. He started using armored vehicles, an anti-aircraft cannon, and the AA-12 shotgun that was most famously depicted in Modern Warfare 2, a fan favorite. Showing a bunch of weaponry that no average citizen would ever have access to, he quickly became the biggest gun channel out there. The success train just wouldn't stop. In June of 2010, Kyle co-founded the still-running podcast called PKA along with Woody's Gamertag and Wings of Redemption, other big Call of Duty creators at the time. By June of 2011, Kyle hit a million subscribers, prompting him to even start a second channel called More FPS Russia, where he'd go into more casual content. By October of 2012, Kyle was even appearing in the official live-action trailer for Call of Duty Black Ops 2 as his character Dimitri. By this year, he had the ninth most popular YouTube channel of all time. You can't talk about FPS Russia without going into the story of a man named Keith Ratliff. Growing up in Frankfort, Kentucky, he was really close with his sister Corey, spending a lot of time playing with her outdoors, usually doing everything together. While Keith was the crazy adventurous type, he was also the studious kind of kid. While in his teens, he got into coding and even made some websites for people he knew, sometimes even getting paid for it. 
Heath was a gun nut, and that's not just me saying that, he often described himself as such. While he was mainly into guns as a hobby, he eventually joined the Navy. He became passionate about gun rights along the way, even carrying with him a small pocket edition of the Constitution in his pocket at all times. He even eventually started working with various different firearm companies online. He eventually went on to start his own YouTube channel called KY Dive Master while living in Florida, where he would mainly make goofy videos related to his other hobby, professional diving. In the process, he got pretty big into YouTube himself. Somewhere along the line, he met a woman he came to fancy on MySpace. They had some dates, hit it off, and eventually got married in 2007. His wife had a child which he took as his own. Unfortunately, the two came to divorce in 2009, but eventually they got back together about a year later. It was an unconventional relationship, to make a long story short. In May of 2010, Keith came across FPS Russia, first finding a video where Kyle got pepper sprayed in the face and tried to fire a gun. He thought this was both hilarious and extremely interesting. On a whim, Keith decided to shoot Kyle an email and get a chat going. This was where he proposed the idea to film an AR-15 video together. It wasn't long before Keith became the main weapons supplier for FPS Russia, as well as Kyle's good friend. In February of 2012, the now 32-year-old Keith picked up and moved out to Canrasville, Georgia to get a business going. In doing so, he left his on-again, off-again wife and child back in Kentucky, but his determination could not be changed. He moved into the small town of about 540 people and quickly opened a business where he would make and repair firearms. He became the co-owner of FPS Industries, a custom firearms fabrication and testing company. He lived in an apartment connected to the warehouse. It wasn't long before he was the main partner on FPS Russia, receiving a good cut of that revenue in addition to his own business. It was the perfect way to blend his interest in both guns and computers. He was all set. Keith was the man mainly responsible for getting all of the crazy weaponry showcased on the show. Unless you have a special kind of federal firearms license, you couldn't get your hands on the majority of the stuff they would show. Keith did, though. This license, a Type 11 license, didn't only give him the right to show the weapons on the show, but also to reproduce, modify them, and sell them on a large scale. You might say that he both had the right and opportunity to be a good arms dealer. With his help, the channel ballooned up into the multi-million subscriber count soon enough. It seemed that the two had quite the unstoppable operation and that things really couldn't get any better. On Christmas Eve of 2012, Keith went back to Kentucky to spend time with the family. He spoke to his sister on the phone, but she was unable to join them. Little did she know, she was missing her last opportunity to see him. Keith and Kyle were on top of the world, enjoying their dream careers, fat paychecks, and adventurous lifestyles. Two weeks later, though, everything would come crumbling down. Keith went back to his home in Georgia after Christmas. New Year's came around and all was normal. That was until the 3rd of January came around. One morning, Kyle and Jeremy, Kyle's friend and member of the FPS Russia team, went into Keith's warehouse for a chat. They came to see Keith slumped over his desk. At first, Kyle thought he was asleep. Once he got closer, though, it appeared that someone had hit Keith in the head and knocked him out. But upon closer inspection, he was cold to the touch. It became very clear that Keith had been shot in the back of the head. Kyle and Jeremy immediately called 911, and the Franklin County Sheriff's Office responded to the call. Given that this was the murder of a minor celebrity and wealthy arms dealer, the police called in the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, the GBI, to investigate the case. The GBI came out to investigate the crime scene and took over the case pretty quickly, working on it ever since in cooperation with the Sheriff's Office. It was clear that Keith had died from a single gunshot wound to the back of the head, behind the right ear, execution style. A statement from the GBI said, There were no signs of forced entry at the business and surveillance equipment along with some firearms had been taken. There did not appear to be a struggle of any kind and, based on the scene, Ratliff died while he was working. Ratliff may have been killed by individuals he trusted. The police ruled out robbery as a motive pretty quickly. Some sort of fight or confrontation was also ruled out as Keith had a gun on his person, along with a few others nearby that wasn't even drawn or fired. Keith's widow has since said, For him to not pull out that gun and try to defend himself, he had to feel comfortable around somebody. Either that or he was ambushed. 
The murder scene was clean, not even a single shell casing was left behind. This led the GBI to conclude that the murder was very calculated. With everything taken into account by this point, it was clearly evident that the murder had been carefully planned and carried out. That day consisted of complete chaos, depression, and shock. It wasn't until the next day that Keith's family was contacted, with his sister Corey getting the phone call that would change her life, being told that her extremely close brother had been executed. It goes without saying that words couldn't describe the feelings that she felt upon getting that call. Kyle, Jeremy, Kyle's dad, and a few other YouTubers who knew the channel attended Keith's funeral not long after. After Keith's death, FPS Russia stopped uploading videos for about a month until February 19th, 2013. Kyle posted a video explaining the loss of a beloved member of the team, but expressed the intention to push forward with the channel. All the while, the GBI was still investigating the case. Given that they had absolutely no leads and no answers to any of the public's questions and seemed no closer to finding a suspect, the public was left to speculate on what had happened. With such a confusing case and virtually no information to go off of, the public began to come up with their own theories as to what had happened in the murder. With Keith's role as a gun dealer and member of one of the most popular YouTube channels in the world, the case attracted a lot of attention. Not only was the murder very unusual, it was related to a public figure. With debates about gun rights being especially hot at the time, with many worried that Obama was going to take their firearms, a lot of people began to suspect that Keith's very open pro-gun stance might have led to his death. Many felt that his stance and status as a public figure might have led to someone who opposed his views to take him out. Others wondered if the United States government themselves carried out the killing, with the theory that they might be trying to get rid of high-profile pro-gun figures. Suspicions were high after this case occurred only weeks after the owner of a gun company was killed in a car crash that many felt was suspicious. Alex Jones went on record himself to show that he believed in this theory, which only made it more popular. The founder of SPS Russian, the biggest gun show in the world, not just on YouTube, biggest gun show in the world, was tied up at his offices, he's a gun manufacturer, and shot in the back of the head execution style. Some felt that Keith's murder may have resulted from an affair. In an interview, his wife had explained that she had discovered Keith had been seeing a different woman recently, leading to a big fight between the two. Naturally, this led people to suspect Keith's wife in the murder, but many others questioned her ability to carry out such a clean and calculated murder. This opened the door to the possibility that either his affair partner or someone connected to her may have carried out the murder. And, of course, some suspected none other than Kyle himself. With Keith out of the picture, they felt that Kyle would be able to go on making FPS Russia videos while keeping the majority of the pay. When questioned by the police, it has been said that Kyle stated that he felt Keith's wife to be the most likely suspect. People online felt this a little suspicious, saying that criminals tend to deflect by throwing someone else under the bus. They cited Kyle's mean, almost sociopathic character on the PKA podcast as evidence. However, there were quite a few holes to this theory. For one, with Keith gone, Kyle would lose access to the majority of the more interesting weaponry used on the show. He didn't have the means to acquire it alone. Not only that, but the show went on a long hiatus afterwards. It appeared that Keith being gone was doing nothing but hurting the profits of the channel. When it came to Kyle blaming Keith's wife, it was noted by many people that this had occurred just after his affair had been discovered. So this likely would have been fresh on his mind as it was with everyone else. When it came to his character on the PKA podcast, Kyle himself has mentioned numerous times that his evil nature on the show is wildly exaggerated because he feels that every podcast needs a villain. He has broken character numerous times on the show, showing sympathy, apologizing, and even being moved to tears for others on occasion. Keith's wife herself has said in interviews in her own words that Keith loved to piss people off. She said that he would pretty often argue, especially with people who didn't like guns. He would often badmouth them and get into small spats with them about it. The theory that people seem to give the most credence to is that Keith's murder stemmed from a gun deal gone bad. Given that the whole murder seems like a professional hit rather than a fight or a regular criminal break-in, this seems to support the theory. Keith was in business with a lot of different dealers, some of which may have been operating on less than legal means. Not only was this limited to gun dealers, but Keith had also been making some shady deals with YouTube channels. 
In an investigation in a video by the Gamer from Mars, he was able to find that Keith had started a small network of gun channels on YouTube, promising to grow their profits if they hopped in. Instead, Keith took a very large cut of their profits after they signed on, leaving them with as little as a third of the profits that they were making before joining. In the end, a lot of people out there might have had beef with Keith. While Kyle has said that, although Keith had a bit of bad blood with some people out there, he didn't feel that any of them held extreme enough of grudges to lead to something like this. Nevertheless, it was clearly a big enough grudge for at least one of them. Kyle wasn't doing so well after the murder. For the most part, he went quiet, especially when it came to the incident. Shortly after, he posted this message up on his Facebook page. As many of you already know, I lost a close friend this week. I ask only that you show respect to the situation for the family's sake. Kyle really tried to get back into the swing of things, but he had just lost his business partner, his gun supplier, and more than anything, one of his best friends. He was extremely depressed after the loss, according to those around him. It didn't help matters that he was being swarmed by reporters, both online and off, trying to get the story while the wound was still fresh. He didn't want to talk to anyone about it, let alone people he didn't even know. According to a representative of FPS Russia, the whole crew was living in fear. They still didn't even know who had killed Keith, and they didn't know if that same person might have a grudge against FPS Russia in general. Without knowing why he was killed, they didn't know if they were in danger as well. While it was going to be tough to start over again, Kyle was able to. He picked the channel back up and started running it for a while. Little did he know, the legal issues were far from over. After Keith's murder and the investigation from the GBI, he, unbeknownst to him, had a target painted on his back. On March 29th of 2013, Kyle's and his dad's farm were searched by more than 40 members of the ATF alongside investigators from the GBI. They didn't only search the farm, but also Kyle's and his dad's homes. Their reasoning was that the farm was the primary location for the filming of the videos and that Kyle was, according to an ATF spokesman, using explosives and getting paid for it via YouTube. The ATF felt that Kyle might be violating a certain federal law involving the explosives that he had been using, although they weren't certain. While it never was outright stated, it seemed pretty evident to anyone following the case that they were likely also searching for any sort of evidence that might be related to Keith's murder behind the scenes as well. After raiding all of these properties, it was found that Kyle had nothing illegal. The ATF and the GBI left entirely empty-handed. No arrests were made, and it seems that no explosives were even seized. Even being found to have committed no crime, the GBI wasn't quite done with Kyle yet. The target on his back was still shining bright. The government continued to pester Kyle from that point onward. Yeah, they absolutely see that's the, that's the, that's what I'm talking about with them like zeroing in on me when they don't other YouTubers like like I've been warned by like federal agencies and and like district attorneys and stuff that like don't do this or we'll come and get you. You know, like like so they're they're very serious about it. So just care. Being in fear that they might come after him again, Kyle decided to delete a ton of videos from the FPS Russia channel. He went dead on social media and went on another hiatus when it came to uploading new videos. After nine months, in January of 2014, Kyle finally returned to YouTube. After such a long absence, Kyle got hit with some divine algorithmic punishment and channel growth slowed drastically. On top of that, YouTube began to get more and more strict with advertising guidelines, causing them to demonetize a very large chunk of gun-related content. With all of the overhead it took to run the channel, the tank in growth, and the demonetization, it was very hard to turn a profit. Eventually, in 2015, Kyle would come to answer a few questions that were prepared in advance by a YouTube channel called The Scene. He expressed that he still had no idea who might have done this and felt that nobody in particular would have had that big of a grudge. He also talked about losing a friend. As far as why he was killed, you know, who's to say? Um, I loved Keith. Keith was my buddy. Keith had been my friend for a couple of years. We traveled the country together. Um, so it's hard for me to say, oh yeah, this person or that person, you know? We, everybody's got enemies, I suppose. People who don't care for the way they do things, you know? He had a... He had a rocky personal life with women. Um, you know, I know he'd had some trouble in business in the past, but nothing that would bring something like this, you know, at least we wouldn't think so, so. No idea, it's uh, no idea. 
It was awful, you know. The guy was young. You know, he's not much older than I am. You don't expect to lose somebody who's in your age group, really. Uh, you know, you prepare yourself for losing your elders, you know. You prepare yourself for losing people who are in bad health, but that wasn't key. So when we lost him, it was, it was a shock to the system, you know. And it's been almost two years now, and I guess it has sunk in now, but still, uh, when I go to places that we went together, when I see a car like he drove, it's kind of like it hasn't sunk in all the way yet, so it's shitty. In 2016, the FPS Russia channel went dark once again. However, this time it wasn't a hiatus. The channel was never coming back. This was because the government was all ready to come after Kyle once again. Kyle still had a ton of guns, some of which would be illegal if not for the license he owned. One day, the cops caught Kyle with a small amount of weed. They took it upon themselves to raid his home once again, this time with the justification being that Kyle was wearing shorts. They said that, since he was wearing shorts, he obviously was on his way back home as he wasn't dressed for a day on the town. Um, they, they wrote a warrant that said they were able to search my home due to the fact that I was wearing shorts. I haven't heard this a little bit. Were they yeah, tie-dye? Because yeah. they're kind of stoner. No, I had some cargo shorts on, and they said because I was wearing shorts, that meant that I was heading straight home with the, with the half ounce of marijuana, and therefore they had the right to search my home. Whereas if I'd wearing, been wearing slacks, I guess, then I was going about my day into the world. They got their warrant and once again descended on the home. In August of 2017, Kyle's property was raided by the ATF and GBI once more. They found that Kyle had received about 25 grams of butane hash oil through the mail. During the raid, the agent seized a whole ton of weapons, about 14 ounces of the oil, and some drug-related paraphernalia. The feds now had exactly what they needed to shut FPS Russia down for good. The Department of Justice prosecuted Kyle on the grounds that owning an illegal drug while owning a firearm is a federal offense. Given that Kyle had shared some of the oil with his girlfriend, the GBI was able to twist the drug charge into a felony charge, saying that, because he gave some to her, he had the intent to distribute. So were you were asking Kyle prison questions? Yeah, yeah, um, the, the, the final charges was, uh, intent, uh, was, uh, possession with intent to distribute. They, uh, the intent to distribute was because, uh, they had proof that my girlfriend smoked a joint at my house one time, uh, through, like, some messaging or some email or some shit like that. Um, that's distributing. I never sold any drugs to anybody ever. Um, that that you know, did, never did anything like that. Um, but but sharing marijuana with a with a with a third par a second party uh, is distribution uh, mm. by the law. And uh, it was made clear in court, like to the judge and even via the prosecutor. She was like, "Yeah, he never sold any drugs. We're not saying that. We're saying he distributed drugs." They finally found a way to hit Kyle with a felony, ensuring that he wouldn't be allowed to own any more guns or explosives from that point onwards. Fifty of his weapons, a collection totaling a value of about $400,000, were confiscated under the Gun Control Act of 1968, which prevents illegal drug users from possessing guns. Kyle was booked into the Franklin County Detention Center. Upon urging from his lawyer, he pleaded guilty to possession with intent to distribute, with all other charges being dismissed. After a few years of back-and-forth legal trouble, Kyle's sentencing finally came in June of 2019. He was sentenced to 56 days in prison and two years of probation to be served at a federal correctional institution. He was also hit with a fine of $7,500. Kyle was finally released in October of 2019. Since his release from prison, he's spoken about the whole ordeal on the PKA podcast numerous times. Episode 459 was entirely dedicated to his return and talking about his experience in prison. Now that he's a felon and can't own any guns, the FPS Russia channel is dead in the water unless the laws change or he decides to move abroad to continue filming. But with his felon status, even that would be difficult. But, but, you know, there's nothing I can do about it now, so I'll just move forward to the best of my ability. I, there, there are certain states that are going to ignore any sort of federal guidelines. There is the possibility that, you know, if maybe that, that if certain people get uh, elected, then they'll start expunging records. And there are various countries that I could just go to, and I'm open to any three of those options. And I'll do one or the, one or the above. The police still haven't made any arrest in Keith's murder to this day. 
The police have said in a statement that they believe that Keith's killer could still be a threat, especially to anyone that might know any sensitive information involving the case. Keith's sister, Corey, has said in an interview with Dateline, To this day, we are still piecing things together. Without any answers, it's been a living hell. I look over my shoulder every single day to see if there is someone behind me. We just want to know who killed him, and we want to know why they killed him. Keith's widow still encourages other people, especially other YouTubers, to continue to talk about Keith's death in order to spread awareness and keep the case alive. And here we are. As of now, the FPS Russia channel still has over 6.9 million subscribers and is nearing a billion views. It's possible that Kyle still might be making a decent amount of money off of the royalties, but that all depends on how many of his videos were demonetized in total. Even with the channel being over, Kyle still continues to appear as a co-host on the PKA podcast along with Woody and, since Wings was fired, Taylor. I love that woman more than anything. And as she died with her liver failing of the cancer that had eaten her body and she was down to 85 pounds, jaundiced orange skin, Kyle, I love you. Her final words to me, she died eight hours later, Still not as bad as what they did to fucking Game of Thrones. I just can't do it. I'm going to cry. Come closer. Don't order weed in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Nini. Once again, thank you for watching my video. If you found it interesting, please give it a like, it really helps me out in the algorithm, and feel free to subscribe if you want to see more content like this. Now, all of these videos will be available in podcast format as well, so check me out on Spotify and all those other good apps. If you don't mind, go ahead and follow me on social media. If anything were to ever happen to this channel again, that would probably be the only way you'd ever hear about it. I always really appreciate when people follow me on Patreon as well. I always keep the link down there in the description. If you sign up, you can get videos early, ad-free and uncensored. Channel memberships are back up as well too, so you can get all those same benefits there as well. So, this has been your host Kyle, thank you, and good night. <laughs>